God has been good, you ought to say amen one more time. If he's been real good, you ought to shout hallelujah. hallelujah. If he's an on-time God, you ought to say thank you, Jesus. And if you're glad he's coming again, let's put our hands together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, giving his name a great praise this evening. Listen, I know the hour is late, but the Bible says that from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, that the name of the Lord is to be praised. Amen, amen. I just want you to know, brethren and sisters, I'm elated and excited for an opportunity to just share the word of the Lord and encourage you further as we try to do what it is that God has called and anointed us to do. And I just want to take a moment to thank Dr. Wilson and the PELP team for the opportunity to just share this word. In fact, uh, when I got the call, I was a little nervous that they gave me Sunday night. In fact, I wanted Monday night because I got in trouble last time I preached on Sunday. Y'all, 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 y'all not with me tonight. Last time, y'all. I, I was hoping they would give me Monday or Tuesday. But last time, it didn't work out so good. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, but in this we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord <laughs> and are called according to his purpose. Again, we are, we are honored. We don't deem ourselves worthy or capable. Uh, we just want to encourage you further in the Lord. Again, I just want to thank Dr. Bird for the opportunity to borrow his pulpit. And I want to thank Dr. Pollard, our university president. Can we give him a hearty amen as well? Praise God for my conference president, Elder Benjamin Jones. And uh, lastly, but certainly not least, I thank God for a beautiful wife that he's given me. Um, I have been blessed doubly. Not only is she anointed, she is fine as well. And uh, <laughs> we've been married now for 14 years and 30 days, about eight hours, and about 24 minutes. Hey, hey. And uh, every day with her gets a little sweeter than the day before. And, I, and after 14 years, I don't feel no ways tired. Do I have a witness in this room? Amen. Amen. Uh, today, we know the hour is late, so we want to go ahead and climb into the Word of God this evening. Um, I want to invite you to stand with me as we go to the Word tonight. Um, I want us to begin this evening in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And my goal is not to be long, uh, but since you all took your time. <laughs> matter of fact, I want you to look at your watches now so y'all don't blame me for how late it is when we get out. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we'll actually skip over into chapter 17, and we'll land in, in chapter 18. 1 Samuel, we'll look together at chapter 15, and then we will begin together at verse number 10. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we'll begin at verse number 10. When you get there for me, just say Amen. Um, the Bible says, now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieves Samuel, and the Bible says he cried out to the Lord all night long. Now I'm skipping verse chapter, chapter 16. We know that Samuel goes and he anointed, anoints David to be king. Then we know in chapter 17, Goliath shows up. But then I want us to look together here in verse number 28. David has been anointed to be king. He has been sent to the battle just to send some supplies. And he then inserts himself. He volunteers to fight. But I want you to look at his brother's description of him. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 28, when you get there, let me hear you say amen. amen. The Bible says, now Eli, uh, Eliab, his oldest brother, when he heard, he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you even come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Notice the description. 
He says, I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you just came down to see the battle. Now, if you don't mind, slip over into verse, chapter number 18, and then we'll just pick it up at verse 5 where we will land for this evening. Chapter 18, verse 5. Again, we get there, just say amen one last time. The Bible says, so David went out, whatever Saul sent him, and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And now it happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and musical instruments. And the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then the Bible says that Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have only ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the cave kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. This evening, saints, I want to talk to you under the subject, a tale of two egos. A tale of two egos. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that in this little while that you would say much. I ask for permission to join my human weakness to your divine strength. I pray, Father, that you would hide me in the shadows of the cross, that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard, and at the end, Jesus alone might be praised. And so, Father, for this moment, make me your avatar. Speak through my lips. Pour your message from my heart. And I pray that somehow in the midst of my fallenness, that the name of Jesus might be exalted. Father, bless us to this end as I pray in the name of Jesus. Let them that believe say together, amen, amen. and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this evening. I want to begin by just sharing with you that most of my life, I've actually only lived in small to mid-sized cities. I grew up in Tallahassee, Florida. I came here to Huntsville for school. I went to Berrien Springs, Michigan for seminary. My first church was in Columbus, Mississippi. My second church was in Lexington, Kentucky. And then seven years ago, God brought us back here to Huntsville. So the truth is, I've actually never lived in a large city, and I've actually grown quite comfortable being a small town kind of guy. And the truth is that there are some advantages to living in a small town. You see, in a small town, we don't have Atlanta traffic. You can get everywhere you need to go in about 25 minutes. In a small town, you don't have Los Angeles cost of living. You can make it okay even on a pastor's salary in a small town. In a small town, we have field mice, not the steroid rats y'all have in New York, and no shade intended, no shade intended. It's just different in a small town. But one of the things I love about a small town is that in a small town, we don't have to worry about the presence of toll roads. Uh, in fact, pastors, whenever I'm in a large city and I see that sign that says toll roads ahead, there is a stress that gathers all around my brain because it just feels oppressive to me and fundamentally un-American to have to pay money just to drive down the doggone street. And, and, and so the Christmas before last, my family and I, we went down to Orlando to celebrate the holiday, which is problematic because if you've been to Orlando, you know Orlando is filled with toll roads. 
And so we were staying down in Kissimmee, and we were going into the northern part of the city. And so I put in my destination in my GPS. And one of the things that the GPS will do is it'll ask the question, do you want to avoid toll roads? And so what it will do is it will carve out a route that allows you to avoid paying tolls in order to get to your destination. And so, of course, I say to the GPS, yes, I want to avoid toll roads. But before I press yes, I did notice that the route that would allow me to avoid paying tolls would add about 25 additional minutes to my drive. And so now I got a little bit of a quandary because not only am I cheap, I'm also impatient when I drive. <laughs> and, and so now I got to manage the tension of trying to decide, am I willing to go the long way around or am I going to pay a little bit more just to get where I was going to wind up in the first place? And so now I make the decision to avoid all the toll roads. And as I got on my journey and I was getting ready to go, I began to look at my watch. And so I went against the inclination of my GPS. I went against my first mind and I got on the toll road anyhow. Now, the funny thing about a toll road, and I didn't understand it, is when you're on a long toll road, you don't just pay one toll. You, you pay a toll every three or four miles. And the other thing I didn't understand is that when you're on a toll road, the toll road prices don't stay the same. They don't go down, but the toll prices go up the further you go down that street. And so the longer I was on that road, the more expensive it got. The longer I was on that road, the more it cost me. The longer I was on that road, the more it took from me. In other words, this quick road depleted me. This fast road diminished me. This fast road began to empty me. And even though I was glad to get to my destination, the fast road took so much from me, I wish I had never left from where I began in the very first place. And, and, and see, the reason I'm saying this is that sometimes we marvel in ministry about how somebody got to such and such a place so fast, but sometimes they paid a high toll that you don't want to have applied to your account. Mm. In fact, what I want to say is that sometimes the route you take is just as important as the destination that you see. And see, sometimes in ministry we marvel at swift ascension in the work, but sometimes you've got to know the shortcuts that we take are simply toll roads in disguise. Mm. In other words, when you begin to cater to the people more than you cater to God, you're going down a toll road. When you scheme your way onto the nominating committee at the session, you're going down a toll road. Uh, when you start scratching their back because they scratch yours, you're going down a toll road. When you start preaching for views and likes on social media, you're going down a toll road. When sermon preparation takes the place of personal devotion, you're moving down a toll road. When you start texting a homegirl too late at night, your text may be free, but it is a toll road. And understand that when you blow the church at the expense of your family, it is a toll road. And the longer you stay on that road, the more it costs. And the truth is you might get there quicker, but it takes so much from you, but it won't be worth it after a while. And see, the crazy thing about it, Van, is that when I got on the toll road, because I told the GPS to take me a different route, what the GPS kept telling me to do was turn around, and it told me to get off the exit on the toll road. And even though I kept on going the wrong way, the thing I love about the GPS is that even when you go the wrong way, it doesn't throw up its hands at you. The GPS doesn't say, I'm done with you. The GPS doesn't say, I'm tired of you. The thing I love about a GPS is that it's got mercy built into it, because even when you go down the wrong way, what it does is it simply recalculates you and helps you wind up where you were supposed to be. Oh, let me shout at anybody that's ever made a wrong turn in your life. Maybe you've made some wrong turns in your ministry. You've made some wrong turns in your marriage. But can somebody shout tonight that God in his mercy hasn't disqualified you. He hasn't DQ'd you. His arm is not too short to save and his ear is not too dull to hear. Are you hearing the word tonight? 
And so y'all don't mind if we study the good book a little bit this evening. Go back with me, if you don't mind, to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're going to look together at verse number 28, and we're going to unpack this thing to look at this evening. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 28. When you get there for me, let me hear you say amen. amen. The Bible says 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're going to look together here at verse number 28. All right, actually, let's start a little early, verse 26. All right, so now we find David now going down to the battle of Goliath. And the Bible says, notice this, Then David spoke to the men who were by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Now, did you notice something? That David's first ambition was not about the glory of God. David's first ambition was find out what I can get out of this situation. Mm, Y'all didn't catch that this evening. So, so go a little further with me. David now kind of politics his way into a conversation with King Saul. Then the Bible says to us here in verse number 31 that when they heard with the words which David, uh, David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you are a youth and a man of war for and he is a man of war from this youth but David said to Saul your servant used to keep his father's sheep and when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock he says I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth and when it arose against me I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. I have killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them. You see, I like David, but I'm a little bit nervous about how much confidence he's got in himself. You see, I believe, saints, that as we've looked at this Saul-David narrative, I believe that maybe one of the mistakes that we've made is we've kind of framed it in a one-sided type of way. You see, the ego of Saul is very overt and very difficult to miss. But because David's outcomes are good, his ego is a little bit more difficult for us to detect. In fact, it reads to me not just like Saul is bad, but in this I see a tale of two egos at work. See, you got to remember now that through the ministry of Samuel that David has been anointed to be king in secret. And you've got to recognize that as the oil falls from David's face, that immediately his worldview is enlarged, instantly his perspective changes, his expectation changes, and the crazy thing about David is that instantly his worldview changes, but his assignment remains the same. In other words, David is anointed for the palace, and yet he is assigned to serve in the field. And the thing that this young shepherd struggles to process is how God can give me such a large anointing, and I can be designated such a small assignment. Mm, Y'all not hear me. You, you see, understand. That, that David is sent to the battle in a servant's capacity. David is sent to the battle in a lesser role. And notice in the text, you never see where God told Samuel or David to fight Goliath because David's role was not to fight. David was sent there to serve. Y'all didn't hear it. In other words, David wasn't sent to fight. David was sent to serve. And yet we find David are volunteering for a lot larger assignment. We find David campaigning for more responsibility. We find David tooting his own horn, extolling his own virtues, reading his own resume. Nobody asked David to be president. David throws his own name into the hat. And, and see, the one thing I've learned about a God call is that when God calls, he speaks for you. You don't have to talk up yourself. Are you hearing the word tonight? You see, y'all don't know who David is. See, David represents that young shepherd who feels like he's entitled to more responsibility. 
See, see, David represents that shepherd who's tired of being overlooked. David is the shepherd that feels like his gifts will be used better in that district. David is the shepherd that feels like he needs more responsibility. David is the shepherd that wants an office because he's tired of dealing with the sheep. David is that shepherd that's tired of waiting on God to elevate him, so he's got to take matters into his own hands. You, you see, the problem with David is that his assignment does not reflect his anointing. And see, this is where David is. He's kind of created his own track of leadership in his mind. And he's kind of come to the conclusion that if I've been anointed to do this, then it's beneath me to keep doing that. If my gifts are going to place me here, then why should I have to keep serving over there? And there are a couple things that David learns the hard way, that the path to greatness is always found on the road of service. Are you hearing me tonight? See, I need some young preacher to know that your giftedness doesn't let you bypass service. Your talent doesn't let you bypass service. Your anointing doesn't let you bypass service. Your ambition doesn't let you bypass service. In fact, if you want to be great, you ought to spend less time watching sermons on YouTube. Spend less time working on your runs in the mirror. Spend less time picking and got your pocket square and your tie. Spend less time plotting your course in the work and more time practicing how to serve the Lord. Are you hearing me, saints? Mm. See, the problem with David is that in this text, David is in a place where he is expecting apprenticeship. He is wanting there to be a clear succession plan where his path to the throne is clearly articulated. In other words, you got to realize how God has set David up. See, God has anointed David in secret, but then he assigns him to serve Saul where he learns the operations of the kingdom from a side seat view. But then he sends him back to the field where in serving the sheep, he learns lessons of compassion and mercy and protectiveness. He doesn't realize that God is just training him in an unusual fashion. And when you don't understand the principle of service, you can't tell the difference between preparation and punishment. Mm. See, I need you to know that preparation and punishment, they look alike, but they're not related. Do I have a witness in this room tonight? Mm. See, see, sometimes when you don't understand that God is preparing you, your assignment will feel like restraint. It will feel like God is not noticing you when God is just preparing you for what he has in store for you. Can somebody shout amen tonight? Like, 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 I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember the movie back in the day. Anybody remember that movie called The Karate Kid? Now, I'm not talking about the new joint with Jaden Smith. I'm talking about the old one with, with Pat Mariah. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And, and y'all remember Daniel in The Karate Kid, he wanted to be a champion because he was tired of being overlooked and picked on. But did you notice that Mr. Miyagi didn't train him to be a champion in the gym? He trained him to be a champion in service. So Daniel had to wax on and wax off. And, and, and Daniel had to sweep the floor over and over again. And, and Daniel had to scrub the floor on his hands and knees. And through repeated service, some muscles were strengthened. Through repeated service, some reflexes were developed. Through repeated service, his ego was tamed. And see, Daniel got to a point where he felt like this was a waste of time. And what Mr. Miyagi did was he just charged and attacked Daniel. But then you'll remember that when he threw a punch at him, all the stuff he learned in service kicked into action. Oh, in other words, what he had been trained to do would not show up in a vacuum. His training wouldn't show up until there was an attack. Oh. In other words, God isn't training you to shine in glory. He's training us to survive the attacks that are going to come our way. Are you hearing me, saints? And that's why I want to say that we ought not ever despise small beginnings or our current place in the work. Are you hearing me, saints? 
See, listen, I can only say this with the clarity of hindsight tonight. I spent four years in my first district in Mississippi, and I can stand here with truth and conviction and tell you that I thank God for every day that he put me in a small church. Because the truth is that it's in a small church that you learn what you need. Come on and say amen. Listen, listen, the truth is if you can preach the five, you can preach the 5,000. Listen, because when you're preaching the five, if three of them ain't feeling it, that sermon is dead. But the truth is that when you learn how to stand in there without a praise team, you ain't got no music, ain't nobody saying amen, but you can stand there with the Word of God in your hand, and you don't flinch just a little bit, then God can use you for even greater. Are you hearing me, saints? I thank God for a small church because it was in a small church when we didn't have any money that I learned how to stretch the realm of my creativity in the work. And it was there that I learned that when the money stops flowing, that the ministry still keeps going. Y'all, y'all not hearing me in, in this room tonight. I thank God for a small church because when evangelistic stuff wouldn't work, it was there that I learned that if this ain't working, that I'd have tried something that actually will. It was in a small church that I learned that all the personalities in a large church God introduces you to them in a small church. It was in a small church that I learned not to take it personal whenever somebody leaves the church. It was in a small church that I learned not to beg everybody to remain in the house of God. I, I, how many of us know that sometimes your deliverance is in a transfer of membership? Oh, y'all, y'all, y'all fooling around with me tonight. Sometimes your deliverance is in a transfer. You don't need to beg everybody to stay, but in some transfers, you ought to bust the misba and say, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. And let me just say this, it doesn't matter how much they give, it doesn't matter who they are, because those who think they're holding the church up are the ones who are holding the church up. Oh, y'all know. In, in other words, they have literally become a stronghold that God has to move out of the way so that God is able to show up in that church. Are y'all hearing me tonight, brothers? Ah, you got to learn not to fight to keep everybody in the church. Amen. But I thank God for a small church, and then that's why I want to tell some of the young preachers that I love who've worked with me at church is why you ought not ever covet the spotlights. And I'm saying that for two reasons. Number one, there ain't nothing that burns like spotlight. The second problem with spotlight is that spotlight reveals defects that you normally wouldn't be able to see. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. See, the reason I praise God for Mississippi is because God hid my mistakes in Mississippi. God hid some bad sermons in Mississippi. God hid some lustful tendencies in Mississippi. God hid my shaky giving in Mississippi. God held my need to be liked in Mississippi. And see, the reason I thank God for sending me to Mississippi is that the things that bruise you in obscurity, they kill you under the spotlight. And see, sometimes we're fighting for more exposure, but we don't realize that more exposure means more exposure. Are y'all hearing me today? And that's why I understand why David shouts when he says, the Lord hideth me. Oh, how many of us can just praise God tonight that he hid you in some stuff? Can anybody just give God a praise for some stuff that didn't come out, for some stuff that didn't make it to the light, for some stuff that could not be proven? Can you praise him for the stuff that didn't come to pass? We ought not praise God for our spotlight, but we ought to thank God that he hides us from time to time. Are you hearing the word tonight? Uh, so we look at this text, and we see that your boy David's, his ego was on 10 just a little bit. Now, the funny thing about David is that David's boast gets him an audience with Saul. You see what David did? David has essentially forced his way into the national conversation. In fact, in fact, after David's defeat of Goliath, the whole narrative shifts from Saul to David, so much so to the point that they sing about David more than they sing about Saul. 
And so you got to realize that what this does is it sets off a chain reaction of jealousy that essentially causes David to have to be a fugitive on the run in the caves for the next 15 years. And the funny thing about it is that killing Goliath results in 15 years of misery. Killing Goliath doesn't get him closer to the throne. Killing Goliath pushes him further from the throne. And I guess the question I'm going to wonder out loud for a moment, was David volunteering to kill Goliath? Was that David's way of taking a toll road? You see, the mistake we sometimes make is assuming that everything that works out well in Scripture was a part of God's plan. But see, remember, there are some instances where stuff worked out good, but it wasn't how God drew it up. Remember how Samson killed the Philistines in his death, but Ellen White says he was supposed to kill the Philistines in his living. Remember when the children of Israel left Egypt, they were supposed to make a beeline right into Canaan, but it was their disobedience that made them go 40 years around, and God had to recalculate to get them into the promised land. Remember Gideon and the miracle of the fleece. Understand Saying that wasn't God's idea. That was God responding to Gideon's unbelief and unwillingness to hear the word of God. And what I'm wondering, did God draw up Saul's jealousy and David's flight into the wilderness, or was that God just recalculating to get David where he was supposed to be? Mm, see, I'm messing with you right now. I, I, you, you, you're worried about it now. See, so remember, let's look at the narrative. Remember there in chapter 15, the Bible says that God rejects Saul as king. In fact, he rejects him so hard that he tells Samuel, stop crying over Saul. It's over with. Then Samuel goes and tells Saul that it is done. And even when Saul repents, God says, there's nothing else I'm going to do with you. Then we get over in chapter 16, and then God anoints David. David to be the new king, and then he trains him to deal with people in the field. Then he trains him to know the palace while he serves Saul. And so now look at the progression that takes place. Remember now that God never tells David to go and fight Goliath. Going back now, God rejects Saul. God anoints David. God tells Saul that judgment is coming, and then the next person that shows up is an undefeated champion of the Philistines who's calling for Saul and his army to come out and fight. Mm. Could it be the reason that Saul doesn't step up to fight Goliath is not because he sees him as a great adversary, but maybe he sees God's judgment that's coming to finally take him down. Mm. See, in other words, your boy Saul is in a catch-22. If he steps up to fight Goliath, then he gets killed. If he does not step up, they get defeated, and his army turns on him. And so I guess what I'm wondering out loud, did God send David to remove Goliath, or did God send Goliath to remove Saul? Did he send Goliath to remove Saul? to make a vacancy on the throne for the one he's anointed in secret and trained in the background so he can just move over to his place. Well, y'all sit out with me. In, in, in other words, what would have happened if David just kept his hands in his pocket and let God be God? He could have saved himself 15 years of misery by just standing back and realizing that the battle is not his, but that the battle belongs to the Lord. Could it be that by fighting Goliath, he extends the reign of Saul 15 years and pushes back what God had anointed him to do in the beginning? Could it be that by pushing his way into the conversation that he pushes back what God had planned for him? Y'all hear me today, saints? And I guess what I want to say real quick is that sometimes our greatest enemy is our own ambition. 
Are you hearing me, saints? That sometimes when we push our way in, we push back what God has ordained for us to do. And see, sometimes we've got to learn to keep our hands in our pockets and let God fight our battles. And see, even things that you've been anointed to do, when you step your way in it and you tamper with the timing, it has a way of backfiring and not working out as God has planned. And so I guess what I'm saying is that maybe you shouldn't take every call that comes your way. Maybe you shouldn't walk through every open door in your life. Maybe you shouldn't tell your own story or toot your own horn. Sometimes we'll just fall back and let God be God over our lives. Are y'all hearing me tonight, saints? Mm. Let me say it this way. I remember growing up in Florida, uh, we would go out and we'd go swimming in these little lakes all around the, the city of Tallahassee. And the funny thing about these lakes is that for the most part, they were still water and they were safe. But the funny thing about these lakes is that you would get out to a certain point and then there would be a rope there. They would draw a line because it would not be safe to swim past a certain point. And so, Benny, I was outside swimming one day and I was playing with this little ball and this little ball began to get pretty close to the little line where we weren't supposed to be. And so, because I wasn't a great swimmer, I didn't want to step all the way out there. And so what I would do is I would reach out and try to grab the ball. But every time I missed the ball, it would create some waves that would push the ball a little further than away from where I was. And so what I would do is I would reach out again, and every time I missed it, I would make some waves that would push it back further than where I was. And then I remember my grandmother shouting to me from the shore. She said, son, stop reaching for it. Just back up. And see, that didn't really make sense to me to back up because it made sense that if I need it, I need to reach for it. But the reason she told me to just fall back is that when you back up in the water, it creates a vacuum or a stream so that when you fall back, what you're looking for just comes drifting where you are. In other words, the more you reach for it, the further back it gets. But when you fall back, it just comes where you are. In other words, stop reaching for promotion. Just fall back and let it come to you. Stop reaching for assignments. Fall back and let it come to you. Stop reaching for a husband. Fall back and let him come to you. Stop reaching for the spotlight. Fall back and let it come to you. Are you hearing the word, saints? So the word, 1 Samuel, chapter 18, verse number 6, the Bible says, and it happened as they were coming home, that David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, and that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments, so that the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David, his 10,000s. Now your boy David got a little ego too, but when you look at Saul, your boy Saul's ego is all the way off the tracks. But, but see, there are three issues with Saul that I want to talk about this evening, and I'm going to take my seat. The first problem with Saul is that Saul doesn't understand the fickleness of a crowd. <laughs> now, Saints, you got, you got to see this thing. This is a triumphal entry back into the city. There is a euphoria that is in the air. They are on the precipice of an unbridled optimism as they contemplate a life free from Philistine harassment. And I can see this thing that as they enter into the city, David is on foot or on a mule, and Saul is up on his exalted steed, and they are walking through the city, and there is pomp and pageantry, there is confetti in the air, there is tailgating on the side, and I can see my man Saul. He's got a little swag in his jostle as he rides in on, on his exalted steed, and, and I can see him as he simply absorbs the celebration and all of the praises that is being directed his way. And so as they march in on the procession, they notice a group of young ladies that have developed their own song of victory. And I can see my man Saul just saying, let's just slow down the procession so that we can just absorb this celebration and hear a little bit about what the ladies begin to sing. And so it gets good to Saul as they begin to sing about all the victories that Israel has won and the ways that God has
is made, but then they get to the hook in the song. And, and, and then, then they say, Saul has killed his thousands, and your boy Saul just is feeling himself. But then they get to the other half and say, David has killed his ten thousands. And Ellen White says that in that moment, Saul is possessed with a demon of jealousy. And see, Saul is messed up because in a single instant, he goes from being their hero to a footnote in their memory just like that. Now, before we get too hard on Saul, I think we can identify with him for a minute because the lyrics of the girl kind of have a certain uh, relevance for us tonight because the truth is, at this point, David hadn't put in more work than Saul yet. See, see, I see why, why Saul ain't feeling this, because Saul is the one that helped them grow into a kingdom. See, see, Saul is burned by this because Saul has been serving them for years. Saul has risked his life for them. Saul has went to war for them. Saul has helped establish them. Saul has shed his blood for them, and it stings Saul to find out just how quickly the crowd can be over you. Mm. See, see, Saul is that leader that has paid his dues. He has put in his time, and everybody's all hyped up over this new young guy that's just now showed up at the party. And it stings Saul to know that after the, all the solid hours he's put in, how quickly everybody can be on to the next new thing. And can I suggest, brethren, that it is erroneous for us to expect loyalties from the crowd tonight? Are you hearing me, saints? See, the shift from Saul to David shows us that no matter how gifted you are, no matter how talented you are, no matter how much you bleed to make it grow, that people going to always shift to what is novice and what is new, even if it is unproven. See, crowds are fickle and curious, and that's what makes them unstable and unreliable. And it is instructive for whether you are David at the center of attention or whether you are Saul feeling pushed to the corner, all of us need to be mindful that the crowd's loyalty won't be around very long. And see, this is the thing that's going to really sting. See, I don't know if the fickleness of the crowd is a bad thing. I don't know if the fickleness of the crowd is a bad thing. I think the fickleness of the crowd is just designed to teach us that we're replaceable. See, the fickleness of the crowd is to teach us that we're expendable. The fickleness of the crowd is to teach us that we're not necessary. See, I think your girl Beyonce had it right when she said, don't you never, ever get to thinking, oh, y'all, y'all, y'all too saved. Don't you never get to thinking that you're irreplaceable in this work. Are y'all hearing me, saints? See, we refer to ourselves as fixtures in the work. But how many of us know we ain't fixtures, we're only vessels. There is only one fixture in the work, and his name is Jesus Christ. And what this is how to do is it ought to reshape how we measure success, where we draw our sense of meaning and value. We spend a considerable amount of time trying to fight our ways out of obscurity, trying to gain some sense of belonging and relevance in the work. And this is what kind of Dr. Lance Witt talks about in the book, Replenish. He talks about the arc of ministry. He says that ministry is like, a lot like the flight of a comet. You know that a comet is in orbit for hundreds of years, but it's only being seen for like two and a half minutes. But then it goes right back into the darkness from whence it became. And he talks about how the arc of ministry is the same, how we start out in obscurity. We're visible for a short while, but then we go right back into obscurity where we started. And he asked the question, have you found enough Jesus in the wilderness that you can survive once you go right back to where you began? And see, this is why our service can't be to the crowd. Our service has to be unto God. You see, the reason if your service is unto the crowd, when the crowd shifts, then you'll feel bruised and betrayed. See, the same crowd that shouted Hosanna on Sunday is the same crowd that said crucify him on Friday. And see, there's this interesting dynamic in ministry that isn't it crazy how those that you give the most, the most, those you pour into the most, those that you make yourself available to the most, they're the very ones that come and stab you right in your back. 
And the only way we can survive 40 years of ministry with the ups and the downs and the betrayals is if our service is to God and not unto man. And it's why if we're going to survive the work, we got to stop looking for reciprocation. Come on and say amen. You can't have no expectation on Pastor Appreciation Month. There can be no expectation for your birthday. There can be no expectation for your anniversary. If they do it, then praise God. But we do all of our service as unto God and not unto man because when the crowd shifts, we'll begin to lose our usefulness. And that's why, beloved, we got to have our loyalty to not to the crowd nor to the institution but to God. Because the crowd is going to always shift, and the institution is going to look out for itself. Oh, oh God. See, the institution ain't going to look out for you. See, see, I've seen in this very city where, where pastors have died after 40 years of service, and there barely be 40 people at their funeral to memorialize their work. I've been to the hospital where pastors were sick, and I've seen pastors' wives cry in my eyes, in my arms, as nobody from the institution they serve even called to see how they were doing. And what I'm saying is that crowds are going to shift, institutions are going to go on, but our service has to be unto God so that when everything goes and everything shifts, that only what we do for Christ is going to be able to last. Are y'all hearing the Word of God tonight, saints? I remember growing up, I, I played play ball with my dad. My dad taught me how to shoot the jump shot, taught me how to square my feet with my shoulders, taught me how to keep my eyes on the rim, taught me how to follow through all the way until the ball had went inside of the hoop. I mean, he taught me everything that I knew about how to play ball. And I remember uh, when I got my first little game, we went on a church league game from Tallahassee over to Jacksonville, and we had done all of our warm-ups, and the game started. I passed the ball around the one side, and the ball came back to me on the other side. And I remember, man, I did my dad's my, uh, voice right in my head. I squared up my feet with my shoulders. I followed through on the shot, and guess what? The shot just happened to go in. And our crowd from Tallahassee was a very loyal crowd, so that when I came running back down the court, all the crowd from my home church was standing up to its feet. But the crazy thing about it is that even though there were a bunch of people cheering for me, none of that stuff mattered because I was just looking through the crowd to, to see where my daddy was. It didn't matter what the crowd said. As long as I found my daddy and he was doing like that, it didn't matter if the crowd shouted or if they didn't. And the reason I had to focus on my daddy is because the next down court down, that time down the court, the crowd was going to be focused on somebody else. See, the crowd only shouts when you perform well. The crowd only shouts when you preach well. The crowd only shouts when your tithe is up. Your crowd only shouts when the church is full. But I can't minister unto the crowd because my daddy praises me, not because of what I've done, but because of my relationship to him. Are you hearing me tonight, saints? Our service must be unto God and not unto man. Second problem with Saul is that Saul can't celebrate somebody else's success. You know, Saul's whole approach to this thing is so counterintuitive. I mean, you know, you would think that if, if David is just killing it, what Saul should do is he ought to just keep David as close to him as he possibly can. But Saul, Saul is so foolhardy that he would literally cut off his nose just to spite his face. And see, one of the reasons that Saul can't celebrate David was because he didn't really expect David to succeed. You, I mean, you saw it in the text. He said, you can't go and fight that Philistine. He's been a man of war from his youth. You just a young boy showing up here at this party. You realize that one commentator says that Saul allowed David to go and fight uh, Goliath, not because he expected him to win. He allowed David to go and fight so he can get some insight on how Goliath moved. 
In other words, David was just supposed to be the test dummy that was not supposed to live to even tell the story. And the reason that Saul can't rejoice is that people can't celebrate beyond their level of expectations of you. Oh, oh y'all not hearing me today. In, in, in other words, people can only celebrate on the level of their expectations. And because people have predicted for you to fail, they can't really rejoice with you when you actually succeed. And, and see, the truth is is that people measure your potential through the prism of their own failure or success. And see, that's why the guy who passes the church before you will tell you that church can't never grow. He'll tell you that that city can't win those souls, that they ain't going to never be able to build a church there. And he's measuring your potential through the prism of his own failure or success. And I just need to know, do we have anybody in this room with a Captain Kirk anointing? You see, you remember the Star Trek Enterprise Enterprise, when it came on every day, it said that the enterprise was supposed to go where no man had gone before. I, I just need to know, is there anybody with a Captain Kirk anointing that believes you can succeed where others fail, that you can thrive where others wilted, where you can swim where others drown, you can prosper where they perish, you can live where they die, you can fly where they were grounded, you can see the invisible. You can do the impossible. And I need you to know that when obstacles seem insurmountable, when armies seem invincible, when the walls seem impenetrable, you got to brace yourself to see God do the impossible. See, that's why we got to learn how to rejoice when others rejoice. Come on and say amen. See, the thing about it that's so crazy is your boy Saul and David, they on the same team. They believe the same thing. They got the exact same enemies. So you would think that if you and I have the same enemies, then that makes us one with each other. But see, for some of us there, we, we, are, we are in this petty phase of life where we see somebody else's success as a threat to our own personal integrity. But one of the things I'm growing to understand is that your success doesn't threaten me. Your success creates a rubric that helps me learn. Oh, Jesus. Your success creates a blueprint that helps me grow. Where y'all at, church? Your, your success allows for there to be new possibilities that I had not even thought of before. When you do well, it opens up my mind to think of things that I've never thought of before. When you do well, it's fertilizer for my thought. It's fertilizer for my imagination. It's fertilizer for my faith. Are y'all hearing me tonight, saints? See, that's why, man, I, I'm going to steal all the stuff I can on evangelism from Jeff Watson. That's why I'm going to learn from Damien how I can make this writing thing work. I'm going to learn from a Dr. Bird how to separate people from their money. I'm going to learn from Myron uh, how I can make this social media thing uh, uh, go to work. In other words, your gifts don't threaten me. They literally enhance me and allow me to grow in the work. Are y'all hearing me, saints? See, and this is the crazy thing about it, is that one of the things I'm learning the hard way, this is why the only thing that's going to help us get on one accord and receive the Holy Ghost is persecution. No, that's the only thing that made them get on one accord in the very beginning and receive the Holy Ghost. You realize that the reason they wouldn't leave the upper room is not just because they're so spiritual. The reason they won't leave the upper room is because they're getting hunted down on the outside. In other words, they stay in the upper room because they ain't got nowhere else to go. In other words, the thing that forces them on one accord is that there's such strong attack from the outside that it presses them together on the same team. And the thing that's going to create unity in the end is an outward attack by somebody else. Mm. It's kind of like this. Uh, Y'all know we've been doing this NFL blackout thing this year. And this year, like the, you know, the uh, professional athletes, they've been kneeling on the field during the anthem. And then the owners have been in the sky boxes and they've been against the players on the field. And the players on the field have been fighting against the owners. And it's crazy because they were both at each other and they were on opposite sides of the equation. Then President Trump stepped into the picture. 
then Trump steps in, attacks the players and the owners, and then before you know it, now the owners and the players arm in arm, they all both kneeling on the same side. In other words, it was an outside attack that helped them recognize they need to be on the same side. In other words, sometimes God has to raise up a Trump, I mean a devil, tomato, tomato, I don't really know. He's got to raise up an outward attack to help us recognize that we on the exact same side. Come on, say amen. <laughs> Third problem with Saul. <laughs> Third problem with Saul. Man, it's late tonight. Have mercy. Third problem with Saul is that Saul is defined by numbers. No, no, Saul mad because they say David didn't baptize more than he did. Saul is mad because David has higher attendance than he has. Saul is mad because David's numbers seem to be higher than his. Let me just say this, that as we live unto God, the worst thing that we can do as preachers is to define ourselves by numbers. No disrespect intended, but I refuse to be defined by the number of message magazine subscriptions I bring at the fall workers meeting. I won't be defined by an in-gathering goal or a fall drive goal. I refuse to let myself be defined by anything that is numerical. Now, let me be clear. I'll allow myself to be evaluated by numbers. I mean, you know, even in your own church, you evaluate certain things by numbers. It's how you monitor success or failures. But I won't be defined by the numbers because the numbers don't tell quite the whole story. See, see, I'm at a place in my ministry and life where my, my goals are so lofty and big that I'm going to fall short of them just by virtue of how, how, how high I set them. In other words, conference goals are where I hope to start, not where I hope to end up. Mm. See, the thing that's problematic, and I pray that somebody hears me tonight who just feels neglected because your numbers don't add up, See, the thing with measuring yourself by numbers in ministry is that there are certain things that the numbers can't count. Where do you count the number of times you had to bite your tongue after a condescending conversation with somebody who thinks they knows your job better than you do? Where do you put on workers report the number of times your kids have been unfairly singled out just because of their last name or who their mommy or their daddy is? Where do you count the number of times you've driven 40 miles to a prayer meeting not to even have anybody show up for worship or to have somebody show up who acted like they didn't even want to be there? How do you count the number of years your wife loses off of her retirement because you've moved seven times in the last 18 years? Where did they record the number of nights that you stayed awake at night praying for the work to go forward and agonizing over folk who don't even pray for themselves? How do you count the number of 2 a.m. phone calls you've gotten because the head deacon's son tried to commit suicide in the closet of their house? How do you count the sacrifice of keeping your kids in a failing school to try to keep the, a good example open for the churches uh, there in that district? How do you measure the stresses your wife bears because she's judged by the way she looks, the way she does her hair? by how long her skirt is, or by whether or not she sings or plays the piano? How do you count the number of vacations that have been canceled because somebody got sick or died in an untimely fashion? How do you count the number of sacrifices that have been made that cannot be put on a statistical report? Where is the plaque for keeping your kids in a failing school? Where is the plaque for all of the things that have gone wrong in your ministry that can never ever be articulated at Evangelism Council? But the good news for somebody today is that there are sacrifices that cannot be counted. There are labors that cannot be quantified. But the good news for somebody in this room is that the God who sees in secret is the God that's going to reward you openly. I just want to say to somebody, be not weary in well-doing because if you don't faint, you shall receive a harvest. I need you to work unto God because soon he's going to say well done good and faithful servant you've been faithful over a few things 
going to make you ruler over many things. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of thy Lord. I'm saying to somebody, don't give up now. He's brought you too far to leave you. So be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain because numbers don't tell the whole story. Mm, let, me, let, let me say it real quick, real quick. I got right here, I borrowed this from a child at Children's Church. I, I got a number, a big number two, and then I got a little number seven. Which number is the biggest number? The two. The two is the biggest number, but which number is the greater number? No, the two is bigger, but the seven is greater. What am I saying, preachers? That sometimes the biggest number ain't always the greatest number. Oh, yeah. In other words, when you're counting baptisms, just know that your two in South Carolina is greater than 12 in Atlanta. Your four in Dwajak is more than 12 in Chicago. Your six in Mississippi is greater than 100 in Huntsville. Your six in El Paso is greater than 20 in Dallas. Your five in Stockton is greater than 100 in L.A. Your six in West Virginia is greater than 30 in Columbus. Your nine in Delaware is greater than 15 in D.C. Your four in in Albany is greater than 20 in New York City. What I'm saying is the numbers don't tell the whole story. It's why we got to be steadfast and unmovable because the God who sees in secret is coming again to receive you as your own. And so don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed because he's coming again. He's coming again. Lift up the trumpet. Loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims. Be joyful and sing. Because Jesus, because Jesus, because Jesus, because Jesus is coming. <laughs>